Exposition by Charles Hedden Spurgeon Matthew 23, 29 to 39, 24, 1 to 21 Matthew 23, 29 to 31 Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore you are witnesses unto yourselves, that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. They talk in the same conceited manner and they claim self-righteousness, as their fathers did. And if their ancestors killed the prophets, these men garnish their sepulchres, and so are sharers in their forefathers' deeds. How often it happens that men say they would not have done such crimes as others have committed, but they do not know the vileness of their own hearts. If they were under the same conditions as others, they would act in the same way. It would have been a better sign if the scribes and Pharisees had lamented before God that they, themselves, were not treating his prophets as they ought to be treated. How very faithful was our master! He was very tender in spirit, but still, he spoke very severely. The old proverb says that, a good surgeon often cuts deeply, and so it was with the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not film the evil matter over. He lanced the wound. He is not the most loving who speaks the smoothest words. True love often compels an honest man to say that which pains him far more than it affects his callous hearers. 32, 33. Fill you up, then, the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? This is Christ's utterance, let me remind you. Our modern preachers would not talk like this, even to scribes and Pharisees who were crucifying Christ afresh and putting him to an open flame. They would search the dictionary through to find very smooth and pretty words to say to Christ's enemies. We are not of their way of thinking and speaking, nor shall we be while we desire to follow in the footsteps of our Lord. 34. Therefore, behold, I send unto you prophets, and wise men, and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues, and persecute them from city to city. Which they did, the servants of Christ were thus worried and harried all over the land. 35, 36 that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. So they did. The destruction of Jerusalem was more terrible than anything that the world had ever witnessed either before or since. There must have been nearly a million and a quarter of people killed during the terrible siege and even Titus, when he saw the awful carnage, said, What must be the folly of this people that they drive me to such work as this? Surely, the hand of an avenging God must be in it. Truly, the blood of the martyrs, slain in Jerusalem was amply avenged when the whole city became a veritable Aceldama, or field of blood. 37, 38. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem! You that kill the prophets, and stone them which are sent unto you, how often would I have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. What a picture of pity and disappointed love the king's face must have presented when, 
with flowing tears, he spoke these words. It was the utterance of the righteous judge, choked with emotion. Jerusalem was too far gone to be rescued from its self-sought doom and its guilt was about to culminate in the death of the Son of God. 39. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Matthew 24, 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Ah, me, the rejected king took but slight interest in the temple of which his disciples thought so much. To them the appearance was glorious, but to their lord it was a sad sight. His father's house, which ought to have been a house of prayer for all nations, had become a den of thieves and soon would be utterly destroyed. 2. And Jesus said unto them, See you not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. And it was so. Josephus tells us that Titus, at first, tried to save the temple, even after it was set on fire, but his efforts were of no use and, at last, he gave orders that the whole city and temple should be leveled, except a small portion reserved for the garrison. Yet the stones of the temple were such as men very seldom see, so exceedingly great. They looked as if, once in their place, they would stand there throughout eternity, but all are gone, according to our Lord's prophecy. 2. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the little procession continued ascending the Mount of Olives until Jesus reached a resting place from which he could see the temple. 3. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the world? There are, here, two distinct questions, perhaps three. The disciples inquired, first, about the time of the destruction of the temple, and then about the sign of Christ's coming and of the consummation of the age, as it is in the margin of the revised version. The answers of Jesus contained much that was mysterious and that could only be fully understood as that which he foretold actually occurred. He told his disciples some things which related to the siege of Jerusalem, some which concerned his second advent and some which would immediately precede the end of the world. When we have clear a light, we may possibly perceive that our Saviour's predictions on this memorable occasion had some connection with all three of these great events. 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Jesus was always practical. The most important thing for his disciples was not that they might know when these things would be but that they might be preserved from the peculiar evils of the time. 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And they did. A large number of impostors came forward before the destruction of Jerusalem, proclaiming that they were messiahs. 6. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars and they did. The armies of Rome were soon, after this, on their way to the doomed city. 6-8. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquake in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. One would think that there was sorrow enough in famines, pestilences and earthquakes in divers places, but our Lord said that all these were only, 
the beginning of sorrows, the first birth pangs of the travail that must precede his coming, either to Jerusalem or to the whole world. 9-14. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. But as for this destruction of Jerusalem, the Saviour gave them clear warning. 15, 16. When you, therefore, shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso reads, let him understand, then let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains. As soon as Christ's disciples saw the abomination of desolation, that is, the Roman ensigns with their idolatrous emblems, stand in the holy place, they knew that the time for them to escape had arrived and they did flee into the mountains. You will say to me, perhaps, but there were Romans there, before. Yes, the Romans were in possession, but the eagles and other idolatrous symbols were never exhibited in Jerusalem. The Romans were often very lenient to the different people whom they subdued and these symbols were kept out of sight until the last war came. But, wherever the Jews and Christians looked and they could see those various images of Caesar and of the Roman state which were worshipped by the soldiers, then were the faithful to flee to the mountains. It is a remarkable fact that no Christians perished in the siege of Jerusalem. The followers of Christ fled away to the mountain city of Bela, in Pura, where they were preserved from the general destruction which overthrew the unbelieving Jews. 17, 18. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. They were to flee in all haste the moment they saw the Roman standards. 19-21. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray you that your plight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation, such it was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. You and I would have believed that all this came true without any confirmation from outside history, but it was very remarkable that God should raise up the Jew, Josephus, and put it into his mind to write a record of the siege of Jerusalem, which curdles the blood of everyone who reads it, and bears out exactly the statement of the Master that there was to be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, no, nor ever shall be.